Welcome to the 2020 Public Health Law Virtual Summit. We have two presentations in this session and each presentation will be followed by a Q&A at the end. Use the chat feature to submit your question and if you encounter technical difficulties during the summit, please go to the navigation menu and select the need help button. And with that, I'll turn things over to our first speaker, James G. Hodge. Charles, Rachel, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be able to join you all today. I'm coming to you live from here in Phoenix, Arizona at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, where we're based in the Western Region Office of the Network. And I'm delighted to bring, for our purposes, a great discussion of what I'm calling public health law on the front lines. What are the prospective reforms that we're seeing for the 21st century in relation to the COVID-19 phenomenon? I mean, this pandemic has completely, obviously changed so much nationally and internationally, but I'll be honed in heavily on the national focus for the purposes of our session. Now, let me give you a little sense of what I'd love to try to cover. Now, things are gonna move really quick on my presentation, and we will make sure if you're interested in the slides, you'll get those at the, in the near future as well. I'm gonna talk about the search for silver, lining, silver, li silver linings in just a second. But what I really hope to do after a very brief introduction in regards to what we're here to accomplish is look at what we're starting to see as potential emerging themes based on change resulting from the COVID pandemic. Now, I'd love to put things in terms of what the top 10 areas I see at least as far as some of these major changes. I'll introduce those top 10 for you. We'll break each one down thematically, do it quick, and I'll give you a neat example of just one of many different illustrative examples of some of how this theme may be playing out for the 21st century. We'll take questions, comments, and thoughts, but only after my great colleague, Rachel Ray Boucher, will be joining us with her a great assessment in regards to reproductive health issues immediately following this presentation. All right, first, special thanks to my great colleagues at ASU and the Neal Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University Law Center, Sarah Wetter, Jennifer Pyatt, Hannah Rinke, all of which have provided some input in regards to this specific presentation. The four of us are working on associated scholarship on this specific front. We'd love to get your perspectives and questions and comments both during the session and afterwards. Do not hesitate to let us know more on that front. Here's the tough message. Here's the hard part of the COVID pandemic. There are no silver linings. I don't see an upside under any circumstances of 6.6 .6 million cases, many of which are preventable in the United States, and I don't see an upside to 196,000 plus deaths in the U.S. in eight months. I don't see upsides. There's no silver lining to be looking for at this point in time. We have and are in the middle of a substantial long-term public health threat that will not be obviated even with the you know, forthcoming nature of what we may see with vaccines and otherwise. It's not time to address silver linings. What it is time to recognize, I think, is we're in the midst of change. And change can be good in relation to what and how we actually think through what we can learn and what types of themes are possible for this century related to COVID-19. So obviously we've got the huge election ahead in November. We've got the presidency you know, on the table. Congress may flip, we may see on that, the Supreme Court, the future of it, as I'm sure Professor Ray Boucher will perhaps mention, all potentially dictated by what happens in the next two months in the election. But let's be honest too, the entire global economy rests on what and how we respond in real time to so many different public health related themes. That's what can lead to the type of change that contributes to what I'm gonna call my sort of top 10 prospective legal reforms. Now I'm gonna introduce these to you very briefly and then let's take them each on and give you a little snapshot of what I think we mean by these top 10 reforms, some of which have played out in other sessions throughout the course of our summit today, which have really been, and yesterday, that have really been great. And they also play out in the plenary session we'll see at the global uh, level after this uh, session as well. Here they are, top 10 major legal reforms, at least the sorts of things that I think we might be able to bank on as the type of change that COVID-19 will lead to for this century. Align them as follows, revamping public health services, nationalization of public health authority, the sort of economic protections we're starting to see possible, improving access, equitable tax incentives, issues related to data unification for the 21st century, anti-discrimination efforts, a renewed sense of health in all policies, what I love to frame as constitutional assurances, and then finally, as Professor Ray Boucher will move into for our part of our presentation, uh, pursuant to her own assessment, maternal and reproductive health interests as well. All right, let's break these down, one through 10. In no particular order of priority, but just really laid out as you're seeing on screen. When I talk about 
revamping public health services, this is what I'm talking about. It's happening in the United States as we speak. We are engaged in a substantial reassessment of public health services across all levels of government. And it's designed to prevent future pandemics. We're learning right now, this has now got to be a 21st century objective again. Consequently, there are new and renewed efforts to engage in enhanced surveillance and testing, screening, social distancing, and vaccination requirements. Frankly, all of these public health interventions are all on the table for reform. And just to be sure, while the examples are manifold across states and feds and the local government, tribal governments, you know, what you saw from the Uniform Law Commission, some of our colleagues who may be on with us today are working on some of these initiatives, is really pretty neat. So the ULC has actually established public health emergency authorities committees. They're looking at model law development on some key issues like social distancing powers. We know we need to rethink those for the 21st century. Executive waiver authority, governance to combat future pandemics. It's time to rethink a lot of these strategies it's happening at the state level. Model law enactment could be a part of that too. Theme two, nationalization of public health authority. Here's what I've got in mind and what we're seeing already before us. There is a unquestioned systematic and extensive reconsideration of all emergency public health laws and policies as you heard me talk about a moment ago. But now it's framed around a little different role. We're starting to see a heavier role for federal roles responsibilities that could lead to increased nationalization of public health services for this century. We're talking about sweeping changes, all designed to create a heavier federal role potentially, not discounting states, not removing them from the mix, but putting an even heavier burden on the federal level. To that end, where do you see like a great example of this? Look at what presidential candidate Joe Biden's laid out in his specific COVID-19 plan. I mean, he's serious about what and how far the federal government can go and much of what he's laid out in the plan resonates what you're seeing in some of the more affirmative state perspectives. But he does see within the plan an increasing federal level role of responsibility for how we respond to the next pandemic as well as this one. That's interesting. And should, you know, or should Joe Biden win the presidency and we see change at that level, could get very interesting very fast. Economic protections. We've never seen, I don't think, nor could have projected the amount of economic impacts that public health measures could actually cause in this country and globally in such short order from literally February till now. Consequently, we've seen Congress and others respond through economic measures, unpredicted and simply unprecedented. So are these predictable for the long term? Can we expect these for the future? I think so. That's what you're starting to see as one of the presenters in our last session talked about with the HEROES Act. Hey, it's in the House, it's passed and we're waiting on a Senate vote, but what it does is include the types of protections nationally for essential workers regarding pay and family care and sick leave on a basis that's just unprecedented and unfounded in regards to what we've seen before. It's time to really start thinking through what and how to balance and couple economic protections in relation to public health interventions, because we've learned fast that if we don't do that well, there are ramifications to that. Improving access cannot underemphasize how critical this is for the century ahead. We're talking about substantial reforms that I think are predictable to basically assure greater access to basic health care and mental health services. We accomplished so much with the Affordable Care Act, and while its future is on the table in U.S. Supreme Court as we speak, there's more to go. And we have national programs coupled with other support measures that are designed to accomplish that. For example, even with what President Trump has done with some you know, highly critical moves in regards to COVID response efforts, his administration actually has pushed something that's been very interesting. Greater access in rural settings through telehealth and other initiatives to the types of benefits and services that simply persons were not getting pre-COVID. You know, this initiative, the telehealth initiative, CMS has punctuated this in regards to some of its waivers and authorities through Medicaid programs, as other colleagues talked about the other day, really essential to pick up on just how far we can go with this for the next century ahead as well. It's a nice opportunity for major change. What about equitable tax incentives? Now, we know that we have the capacity to reshape behaviors in the United States using tax and spend approaches in a systematic way. It's lawful. In fact, it's actually among Congress's strongest powers and at the state level too. But I'm talking about implementation to revise federal and state tax laws. They're designed to incentivize the type of greater provision of use of health services equitably across populations. I'm talking about the types of tax incentives that encourage the types of uptake of public health interventions that will make the critical difference. There's a lot of examples of these across federal and state levels. This one's kind of interesting because it comes from Senator Ted Cruz as an introduced act called what's called the WorkSafe Act on June 16th, basically to allow tax breaks 
for businesses whose employees receive COVID-related testing. Now, there's some real significant limitations to a bill like this, and let's be sure it hasn't even made its way through the Senate yet, but what it's designed to do is to use tax schemes as the basis for encouraging greater public health uptake. Now, that's a strategic approach. We have full authority to do at every level of government, with the exception of some local limitations, and it's a new innovation I think we're going to start to see even increasingly used for the next several decades ahead. Data unification. What are we really talking about here? It's just time. It is time to unify data gathering, reporting, and sharing practices across public and private sectors. It's time to couple that with a re-envisioned sense of what health information privacy actually means for the 21st century. We're still living off the HIPAA privacy rule as a sort of primary mandate for how we assess privacy. It's feeling dated, it's feeling worn out, and it's feeling like it's not accomplishing what all we may be able and need to do for the purposes of 21st century health information privacy protection against this backdrop. The backdrop of needing greater enhanced unification of critical surveillance in regards to COVID-19 and every other type of major public health threat for the century to come. This is that moment where we can do this well. And you're starting to see interesting proposals like for example, Senate Bill 2850, Equitable Data Collection and Disclosure on COVID-19 Act that really would introduce revitalized federal-based data collection against the backdrop of HHS overtaking CDC surveillance program earlier this summer. It's time to rethink this. Dashboards that actually make sense for consistency across states working within privacy norms that we've reconceptualized for the long term. Anti-discrimination, this has been revealed so drastically and really it's just so horrifically in relation to what COVID-19's exposed that many of us already saw, but a lot of the nation hadn't. It's time to really consider the type of continued or enhanced legal uh, efforts to thwart anti-discrimination in every possible way when we're delivering public health services and benefits on what everybody would recognize as spacious grounds, race or ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identification, anything that might be reconceived as a kind of contravention of known human rights, it's time to really rethink the anti-discrimination measures at stake. I love what you see in Michigan because their governor, Gretchen Whitmer, former vice presidential candidate or uh, considering, you know, really has signed on multiple occasions, executive orders. And those orders are for real in relation to what she expects across her administration in Michigan regarding equitable administration of healthcare services, flatly prohibiting consideration based on race and sex and homelessness and other criteria. These are emergency orders. I think these will become more the standard norm for how we deliver healthcare services in states like Michigan and other places daily and across the board as a routine measure ahead. What about health and all policies? This is not new. We've had this in place for two or three decades now. The conception of it, the thinking of it, the health justice principles that underlie it. What's new? I think there's a very significant renewed assessment and acclamation of HIAP as a mantra for legislative or regulatory reforms across all sectors with definable and accomplishable goals for states and their local communities. What has COVID-19 shown us? HIAP is a legitimate way to actually accomplish quickly and potentially with you know, public buy-in and political support as well, more defined, more critical goals. It was emphasized in one of the great sessions previously on social determinants of health. HIAP is a way to accomplish it. We've seen a lot of examples emanating from the COVID-19 response efforts across all levels of government. I really like what we saw from CDC, notwithstanding the fact that his colleagues of mine right now in the Eastern region of our network are discussing in a different session focused on the legal challenges already in play in Atlanta related to CDC's eviction notice or order. What CDC did there is to reassess what its power is to actually abate the types of communicable disease issues it's seen. And when evictions make that particular control of communicable diseases that much harder, Dr. Redfield suggests, CDC's got the authority to actually stop those and put them in their tracks at least until the end of this year for private and non-commercial related landlords and others. Interesting use of CDC's basically communicable disease powers to accomplish something on a very different scale. We just not seen them attempt to do them before. Other measures like this equated across states that you're seeing as well, very interesting. Two final observations. This one's neat. I really like this because we've done some interesting work on this, watching all the constitutional debates in relation to COVID-19. I'm actually interested in what we call constitutional assurances. And I'm interested in this principle along the lines of what's being suggested right here. It might just be time in the 21st century 
to actually start to think about how we generate something greater than some sort of general sense of what government needs to do in response to these issues. I'm after assurances. And I'm after corresponding legislative reforms that reflect constitutional assurances that are designed to basically address those types of health disparities. Whether you want to frame it in equal protection rights or you want to reflect it in regards to the access issues to public health, housing, transportation, or other critical benefits, there's pathways to accomplishing this that we're discovering and potentially have the opportunity to open up for this next century ahead. It will depend a lot on what the Supreme Court cost, or sort of um, members look like and what and how they want to make decisions on this front. Let me tell you about a scoping theme <clears throat> that we've done very recently in some of our own scholarship. I think it's legit. We've got a chance to actually really rethink whether there is some sort of constitutionally grounded right to public health that we can locate within the federal realm that would put aside some of the bandwidth and or banding about in relation to politics underlying how you've seen responses. We're talking about generating, developing a plausible and purposeful constitutional right to public health to address in what we call inherent vices that stem from clear and obvious government failures to actually respond to base level of health services for the for individuals across the United States in response to COVID-19. The arguments there can be delivered and gotten from this US Supreme Court or at any level of court, that may be a really neat place for us to actually look forward to in the years to come. Finally, maternal and reproductive health interests. To this end, for my purposes, we're rethinking and reevaluating all laws and policies that affect women's rights and maternal and reproductive rights, that is, an interest to assure a stronger safeguards against unwarranted infringements and alterations in mid-crisis. I could go into this in more detail, but won't. I'm turning it over now to my great colleague, Professor Rachel Rebache, who will take us into her a presentation, assuring access to abortion and reproductive services. Thank you all. We we'll look forward to questions at the end. Thank you. Um, I am having, there we go. Uh, thank you. I am delighted to uh, share with you uh, my contribution to a, uh, the rapid response report, abortion access under the pandemic. Um, though I could cover a range of reproductive health issues and I will touch on some, um, I'm going to focus on abortion law and policy as an example of some of the political pressure that could be brought to bear to usher in new approaches to reproductive health care during the pandemic and after. So as you likely know, 12 states suspended abortion care for differing lengths of time uh, in response to COVID-19 this past spring. State officials argued that banning abortion as a non-essential surgery reduce patient physician contact and preserve medical supplies, hospital space, healthcare capacity. These policies were enjoined uh, by courts lifted after settlements with state officials or expired when executive orders expired. In the states in which courts intervened, federal district courts enjoined the suspensions as unconstitutional pre-viability bans. However, two federal circuit courts allowed executive orders to stand, at least in part. The Texas litigation uh, illustrates what was at stake. Texas executive order suspended all abortion, even medication abortion. And the Texas lit litigation illustrates the confusion caused by the COVID suspensions. The policy was enjoined and then reinstated three times. Reversing the federal district court, the Fifth Circuit held that Texas abortion ban was a reasonable way to conserve medical supplies and hospital capacity. The Fifth Circuit determined that even medication abortion, which entails taking two pills, reduced supplies of PPE because of ultrasound and in-person counseling requirements, Texas law requires of all abortion patients. The Fifth Circuit, uh, though time doesn't allow me to give a thorough description of the litigation, um, the Fifth Circuit accorded broad deference to states, uh, to the state of Texas to exercise its police power. It cited a Supreme Court case decided in 1905, which upheld a mandatory smallpox vaccination for the proposition that the court could not, quote, second guess Texas. It discounted evidence that suspending abortion increased costs to the healthcare system because patients will travel out of state, self-induced terminations, or carry pregnancies to term. During weeks and weeks of fluctuating legal status, the hardships from state bans were clear. Patients had their appointments canceled with a moment's notice. 
clinics reopened with long waiting lists for appointments, the cost of denied or delayed abortion vividly illustrated that care is abortion care is essential health care. So just think about, I want to think about the cost and the stakes uh, uh, of those bans and what they mean moving forward, particularly in a context for some circuits, the eighth and fifth, of state deference. Public health research has, has demonstrated over the course of a number of decades that abortion restrictions undermine public and patient health. In the context of the pandemic, suspending abortion does not conserve scarce medical resources and does not impede COVID spread. Banning abortion has the net effect of greater consumption of health resources. So thinking about it first on the patient health level, Many who lack abortion will travel to other jurisdictions to end their pregnancies, consuming the same medical resources but requiring providers in neighboring states without the assistance of additional staff to manage a host of new patients. So as a result, we saw increased wait times and crowding in neighboring states with uh, the states neighboring those with abortion suspensions. And with that delay, we saw additional costs, procedures later in pregnancy, patients timing out of legal abortion altogether. And it goes without saying that those who travel for abortion care cannot limit social contact in the same way that they might otherwise and take risks that could be avoided but for their state's animus toward abortion rights. People who cannot travel might terminate pregnancies by procuring one or both of the pills taken in a medication abortion without any supervision, without, without physician supervision. Self-managed abortion can be effective and safe. However, it can also increase costs for the healthcare system if patients lack accurate information and adverse um, consequences occur. On the population level, the majority of abortion patients live below or, or at the federal poverty level. And the majority of abortion seekers in many places are people of color. And I, I refer here on this slide to the Turnaway study, which I which I highly recommend. Abortion restrictions fall disproportionately on people who are unemployed or essential workers. Those who do not have access to healthcare cannot afford the additional cost imposed by abortion restrictions, lack transportation, live in multi-generational housing. Uh, in other words, the people hit hardest by COVID-19 have seen deep and unequal access to health resources and health disparities. And for almost all abortion patients, legal restrictions erect varied obstacles. They require people to secure childcare, transport, time off work, and they perpetuate deep health inequalities. So the one way to also think about this issue is the effect and the ripple effects on public health. The cumulative effect of abortion restrictions coupled with the stressors of the pandemic deep in poverty and structural inequalities, not to mention that unplanned childbirth has deep costs and health risks, particularly the low income people and people of color, but on the health system generally. Many people listening know, for instance, that the US has the worst maternal mortality rate in, the compares in comparison to countries similarly situated. Black women are far more likely to die in childbirth than white women. This is a public health crisis that abortion law and policy makes worse. So, in thinking about the way forward, I chose to focus on medication abortion because state and federal regulation of medication abortion not only contradicts the broader incorporation of telehealth measures, but also shines a light on how public policy can threaten people's health and well being. Almost 40% of the nation's abortions are medication abortions at this point. Medication abortion occurs in the first 10 to 11 weeks of pregnancy. Patients, for those not familiar, ingest mifepristone, followed by a second drug, misoprostol, taken 24 to 48 hours later. Thus, medication abortions simply require no gown, mask, eyewear, shoe covers, gloves. In other words, no PPE is used. Like the majority of termination, medication abortions is not administered in a hospital or physician's office, but typically in a standalone clinic delivering a variety of reproductive health services. The risk and complications associated with medication abortion are low, extremely low, rarely is a hospital bed needed. I think it's important to put these, that information out there in the sense that what we're seeing in some of the debates around deference to states and state policies is a contest not new, but the same, a contest over facts and a contest over evidence. 
So this is a slide that I pulled from Kaiser because I think it, though it's a lot of text, it's just a visual of what research demonstrates that, that research demonstrates medication abortion, like other healthcare procedures, can be safely and effectively administered online or over the telephone. In other words, teleabortion could permit no touch terminations. No touch terminations are suited particularly for patients who are not at risk of uh, various medical, uh, uh, a few medical complications, are less than eight or, or so weeks pregnant and have regular menstrual cycles. Numerous studies, as well as a trial uh, uh, conducted by Genuity, um, illustrate that direct to patient teleabortion is safe and effective. However, there are numerous legal obstacles to providing medication abortion through telehealth means. 18 states mandate that pre prescribing physician be physically present. 33 uh, prohibit non-physicians from administering medication abortion. Nine explicitly banned telehealth for medication abortion. These laws are stacked on top of other abortion restrictions, such as pre termination ultrasounds and counseling, that apply to all terminations regardless of type and necessitate clinic patient contact. And I draw this slide from the Abortion Law Project that's hosted at Temple's Center for Public Health Law Research. Just a quick shout out to that great resource and the great research great researchers there. Um, on the federal level, the FDA applies a drug safety program to Mifepristone, a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, or RIMS, which mandates, among other things, collection of the drug at a clinic, physician's office, medical center, or hospital. Moreover, 20,000 drugs regulated by the FDA, Mifepristone is the only one that patients must retrieve at a medical center, but may self-administer without supervision. In fact, the FDA permits mailing the same compound when not prescribed for abortion or miscarriage to a patient's home in higher doses and in larger quantities. The effect of the RIMS classification is that medication abortion cannot be mailed or picked up at a pharmacy, which in effect prohibits teleabortion. And the FDA's enforcement of the in-person requirement for misoprostone stands in stark contrast to the numerous ways the FDA, as well as other federal agencies, have encouraged telemedicine as a response to the pandemic. The pros and cons of which, sadly, are being discussed right now in another session that's happening. Um, but wait, uh, a recent case uh, temporarily lifts as a response to the pandemic, the FDA's in-person requirement. So in addition, to the, in, in addition to arguments about the drug safety and the FDA's exceptional treatment of medication abortion, the plaintiff, the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, or ACOG, argued that the in-person requirement burdens abortion access for those hit hardest by COVID. ACOG relies on studies, what I, uh, what I mentioned earlier in, in passing, that highlight how low-income patients and people of color are more likely to become ill, to have inadequate resources to respond to illness, and will have worse health outcomes as a result of deep health inequalities. This July, the Federal District Court in Maryland agreed and issued a nationwide injunction against the FDA protocol for the duration of the COVID-19 emergency. So long as the decision stands, providers may counsel patients through telehealth and can mail mifepristone to patients through a supervised delivery method. So not a retail pharmacy, but an uh, in-house or another uh, pharmacy that the physician has a relationship with or another supervised delivery service. The U.S. government has appealed the district court's decision to the Fourth Circuit and recently asked the Supreme Court to issue an emergency stay. The petitions filed by states as amici and by the government contests that in-person dispensation and counseling impose any heightened risk for patients. So consider that states such as Texas, which banned abortion in March and April, now claim that COVID poses no threat for people needing to seek medical care. So what might this all mean? I think that um, there are a number of ways to talk about this. Uh, uh, there are a number of, of, of paths forward to take. Bottom line, uh, for, for my thinking, uh, in collaboration with some others, is that, of course, rather than suspending abortion, expanding access to medication abortion in particular, 
through telemedicine could help impede COVID-19 spread. Uh, regulation currently makes delivering medication abortion unnecessarily difficult. The federal government, as, uh, as, as mentioned, has expanded telehealth for non-abortion medical services, recognizing the importance of solutions that limit contact between professionals and patients. At the same time, a bill before Congress, the Teleabortion Provision Act of 2020, difficult to know what this piece of legislation addresses, excludes abortion services from telehealth measures. So as though these steps suggest some um, uh, political obstacles uh, to uh, expansion of abortion care, I think the ACOG litigation suggests change is possible and change has happened. Some states have recognized abortion as essential health care that must remain available during the national emergency. A couple of others, like Virginia, have repealed waiting periods and other abortion restrictions. But more, of course, needs to be done specifically to address the structural and systemic inequalities that plague reproductive health care. Lowering the cost of abortion services, lifting funding bans that prohibit subsidizing abortion care, transforming lives so that deciding to have a child is a real choice, affording to have a child is a real choice and rebuilding our failing health infrastructure. In this regard, I see some of the work I'm doing and uh, some of the work in the reproductive rights and justice space as connecting to work on the social determinants of health, great presentation earlier today, civil rights of health presentation yesterday. And I think I will stop there so we have ample time for uh, thinking about these ideas and others in Q&A. Thanks so much. So thank you both to James and Rachel for your wonderful presentations. For all of our attendees, please use the chat function in Passable to submit your questions. I see some have already come in, so let me just take a quick look. Um, it looks like we have our, uh, a question from our colleague, Peter Jacobson. Um, so Peter asked, James, can you say more about the desirability of shifting the responsibility for public health to the federal government? what would the implications be for state and local health departments? Well, Peter, I'm telling you, that is a great observation. It's literally happening, and I think we'll continue to see it happen in the next several decades ahead, but there are real consequences to it. There's upsides and there's downsides. So let's be real clear about an upside. First of all, very systematic failures at the state level to actually engage in what's known in efficacious and responded to COVID-19 is completely unacceptable, I think, for the next major pandemic ahead. There's a lot of preventable cases and deaths that are tied to state politically driven choices that are just not efficacious. Feds could correct for that with some nationalization of how we actually see that, that could be a very good end. The downside is some states have shown us the pathway nationally of what works by engaging in experimentation. As my colleague Sarah Wetter and I were discussing back and forth on the preemption side of things, that's gonna get really interesting should we see a very heavy federal hand in regards to what and how far we go with prevention efforts if it did preempt states from doing things would actually prove to be very workable. So here's how I think we actually counterbalance it. First of all, I'm not suggesting what you're seeing in the Biden plan is the cure all for this, but I will say there are definitive things that are being represented in that plan that I think we can stand by as definitive, or at least for our purposes of learned lessons already from COVID-19 that if we can actually perfect for the future. Issues related to something more than just national statements or national objectives, but actual pure recommendations and or mandates about how we respond in real time. Things that are constitutionally sound, but federally driven. States getting money based on them doing these sorts of things. Uh, Americans understanding their civic responsibility to engage in those specific efforts. But leave for states and localities on the front line still the complete authority to engage as need to actually effectuate some of those critical measures and deal with those in real time. That's, I think, a more balanced approach and what we probably see for the next, literally, next event ahead but it's what's starting to show up and crafted from some of those federal objectives that at least could surface in the next election for sure. I hope, Peter, that gives you a little sense of how I see that playing out over the long term. Change is essential here. This is not a moment where we can say it's 19th century public health interventions under that federalism structure. We do see a federal health role that's different and distinct. How we craft that out, that's what's coming. I hope that helps a little bit. Great, thank you, James. So the next question that we have is, 
the Indian Health Service prohibits use of funds through their or tribally 638 funded clinics. Could you speak to the discriminatory aspect of this policy? Gosh, and I think that's for me, although Rachel, I'll be deferential if you know about the application of that to reproductive health related concerns. So unfortunately, I'm not as familiar with what, you know, that specific section may entail and I need a little bit more information to work with, but let's be sure about something that came up actually yesterday in our, our Western Region question and answer session we did towards the end of the first day of the summer. You know, the, the facets and issues that underlie tribal health, tribal issues, the sort of balance of what and how we've actually seen federal government negotiate with tribal uh, authorities on these specific fronts is also on the table for reconsideration for the next you know event ahead. It's part of what I see as sort of for, as uh, essential to some of those critical major themes. I'm unfortunately not the expert to give you the best guidance about how we think that through. We work a lot with some of our really great tribal authorities here both at ASU at Arizona State University and across the Western region. And I'd be delighted to get back to you on more on that. Send me an email to that effect and I'll look forward to addressing that more systematically. But Rachel, do you have anything on the reproductive health side of that you wanted to add? Well, I think that, you know, I, and I would, I would love to be um, corrected if this is, if this is not um, entirely accurate, but I, I think that, um, of course, the, there, there, there haven't been carve outs, for example, for, for federal law and, um, but their abortion restrictions by state, those apply to providers, whether or not those providers provide services um, in, in territories or not in territories. And the, 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 the funding for other family planning services or the like, that, that's an interesting question. And, and as, a, as, as a lot of people know on this call, that that is something that is now being considered whether or not Trump's uh, uh, revision to family planning uh, funding uh, and res additional restrictions on providers will 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 uh, we'll see we'll see the next few years will will be sustained. But I would I would like to I would love to know more from the question asker. Maybe maybe send me a private chat uh, mm -hmm. about what exactly you have in mind um, because I'm not entirely clear what the question um, what the as you know, how the what the question is aimed at. Yeah, it's a great point. Clarify it a little bit further with us, so see if we can circle back on it. Charles, what else do you have for us? Yeah, so this question is directed to James. So when looking at the nationalization of public health authority, what issues do you foresee with regards to state police powers? Well, we have been in a very interesting sort of balance of how we actually assess the sort of primary responsibility for delivering public health services in the United States. We've comfortably lived under a, you know, a rather a significant series of adjustments in response to COVID-19 that have increasingly sought state intervention using their police powers, where we often say from the public health perspective, that's where the action's at. The states have the fullest range of what we can do from a public health perspective. But the sheer reality is, is that the diversification of those approaches across states has led to pretty much preventable morbidity and mortality in relation to it. If we were to see a stronger federal presence with real deliverables, real efficacious interventions, and the types of guidance that actually comes with funding that only the feds can produce, I think states would buy into that and obviously equate some of that and some of their change policies. That can be very good for down the road. But the sheer reality is if we are to nationalize these events, viewing them more as like national security threats, which almost then partakes in almost exclusive federal control over some of those interventions, mm -hmm. what role do states play at that juncture? From a police power perspective, they'll always, always be on the front lines of intervening for the purposes of their own populations. But we need to put to rest some of these very, um, what I'll even say is sort of uh, counter perspectives or counter efforts that states have done in response to COVID-19. Let me be brief here. I'll give you one simple example, and it's part of what and how federal authority here could be used differently. So you've seen states literally put up almost the equivalent of concrete barriers between their states as borders, if but to say to individuals, don't come across. If you do, you're gonna be quarantined or indoor isolated for a 14 day period, notwithstanding the fact that you've actually got no known exposure to COVID-19. We've seen so many states do this. They're not real barriers, but they're the types of things that tell citizens who have a full right to travel across all different perspectives, don't come to our jurisdiction unless you're prepared to be quarantined that lacks in so many different ways constitutional grounding. We've seen some courts like in Hawaii differ on that question. 
but it really does present very interesting issues of how far states should be going with their police powers against the backdrop of what the feds could insert with their CDC powers to control for that, those types of limits as well. Now we've got a lot to balance and a lot to figure out for, for emergency preparedness and response to these specific efforts going forward, but that change is forthcoming and I see it as a 21st century objective for this public health system in the United States. Great, thank you, James. Um, so an attendee asks, what will be the safety valves if there is a public health emergency, but the federal government is not willing to act and states and localities feel action is necessary? Yeah, well, great question. And I'll actually defer to Rachel on this in a moment too for her perspectives on the safety valves against what and how the reproductive interests and the health interests are so profoundly impacted. We're looking at a safety valve in two months. I mean, we've got the potential to make substantial change nationally based on what every other country would say are gross failures of the world's wealthiest country to actually control for COVID-19. So we've got that political uh, sort of route to always utilize across the country. But even if political change is not afoot and we're not capable of making those sorts of critical decisions in real time, there are always safety valves embedded within checks and balances and separation of powers principles that allow for a, you know, more affirmative provisions, judicial activism, specific efforts and measures. I think one of the things that you're clearly seeing in response to this particular pandemic that's been a really neat safety valve, I've been watching it very carefully, are the use of courts, <clears throat> particularly how far we can go to get a federal district court or a federal appellate court to intervene and make change systematically against the backdrop of some really egregious policies. But to be sure, it's a, it's a tough question if the feds do fail in their effort, I would actually espouse, or well, that's why we could actually start to reconceive some sort of right to basic public health services that do exist constitutionally. It's a structured argument, it's a difference, it's a difficult sell, and it's not yet something the Supreme Court I think would buy. But let's see where we go with this with COVID as the backdrop. Rachel, what about the safety valves that might exist on the reproductive health side? So, you know, I'll, I'll take up your last point, James, because I think it's so interesting. I'm not sure that those who support abortion care or abortion rights or abortion services would necessarily look to the courts as the, the, the institutions that are the protectors of, of constitutional rights in that regard. Um, certainly not in some places. So if you are, if you are filing and you, and you find yourself in front of the Fifth Circuit, I don't think that you think that the Fifth Circuit is going to necessarily be the champion of a um, robust health conception of abortion care. In fact, um, I think there's something really interesting uh, about the question because, of course, for uh, reproductive rights, taking abortion specifically, there's a there, there your place matters quite quite a bit. Where you are, where you live, where you reside can determine what type of, it will determine what kind of care you re receive and what, what obstacles are in your way. So, you know, take the example of Texas from, that I mentioned earlier, the kind of abortion opportunism to suspend abortion as a COVID protection measure and now to argue against FDA, uh, uh, you know, against lifting the FDA protocol because there, there is no need to protect from COVID uh, any longer it, uh, argues Texas and Oklahoma and other states who have joined as amici in that case. So that's a quick example to say that, that, that they're playing, they're writing for, for instance, the Supreme Court, who, um, you know, again, to re responsive to your point, who, who, may, who may take the Fifth Circuit's line and it suggests it would, that, um, you know, the, the Federal Circuit is not going to be pro- will not, not, necessarily, not necessarily be proactive in legislating uh, against uh, abortion rights. I don't think the Teleabortion Act is going to pass. Uh, but that said, they are not going to stop any state necessarily from passing abortion restrictions. And so I'll wrap up in a second, but a case decided in June, June Medical Services versus Russo, the Supreme Court uh, struck down a Louisiana law that required admitting privileges for physicians at hospitals that were no more than 30 miles away. And in doing so, um, there are four votes, a judgment for the court 
uh, that balance the benefits and burdens of an abortion restriction and specifically talked about burdens on poor patients. The critical fifth vote was Chief Justice Roberts, who concurred in judgment to respect precedent. The court had decided a very similar case uh, on almost an identical law four years earlier. But Chief Justice Roberts, who's now apparently the swing vote uh, for uh, the Supreme Court on the issue of abortion, uh, uh, wrote that uh, he did not, he thought that legislative deference was the way to go. And that uh, in thinking about what, uh, the burden of abortion restriction imposes, one, not need, one does not need to consider whether or not that law provides any health benefits. In his estimation, uh, it's only if a substantial obstacle stands in the way on a person's path to an abortion, not if the law that Texas passes has no identifiable uh, safety, health, or other benefit for the patient. Well, that's not, that's not a safety valve <laughs> in a lot of ways. And it's not necessarily good health policy if states have broad freedom to enact laws that have no health benefit whatsoever. Interesting. Great. Charles, great stuff. What else you got for us? Thank you both. Um, this question is directed to Rachel. Uh, one of our attendees asks, where can we find more information about which states are implementing teleabortion and the experience surrounding this method. So a couple of great resources. Uh, I'm gonna put my email in the chat box. Please, Vanessa, email me directly. Um, I've been keeping lists, but also the Kaiser Family Foundation is a great uh, resource for information about teleabortion, medication abortion. The um, uh, trial that I mentioned run by Gnuity, G-Y-N, UITY has a, um, a website in which it, it is uh, uh, details its uh, exemption from the FDA protocol to launch teleabortion services uh, uh, in states and then measure uh, the effectiveness and the usefulness of, the, of those services. And then I'd say the Center for Reproductive Rights in collaboration with Columbia's Public Health School has a great primer on the issue. Um, Lots of great resources uh, that I'm very happy to share. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so the next question is from an attendee who was wondering, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there have been some issues with state health departments altering the presentation of data. How can this be discouraged, especially in the light of the concepts of greater federal responsibility and data unification? So true. And I know it's true because we've seen it here in Arizona uh, through our own department and some of what we've seen in Maricopa County, of course, you know, the home of Phoenix. So we've seen these specific issues. These have been profound. These have been damaging. They're just deleterious in every way possible in the, in the midst of a real-time pan pandemic event like we're seeing. And it doesn't help at all, does it, that in the midstream of what and how we're actually trying to do better data processing, we actually get through HHS a mandate to start shifting gears from who you report to at CDC, now up to somebody within the White House for the purposes of a private contractor who'll be doing some of that dashboard type of work nationally. That really was confusing over the course of the summer and governors were all over that in relation to some of their concerns about why and how we spe you know, specifically see that sort of data management and data unification sort of objective being rerouted in real time. Hugely controversial. What it boils down to is this, when you see it and when you want, you know, when you see the specifics for data withholding or data mismanagement or data errors or failures, these are preventable too and lives are at stake. But to be sure, we have underfunded these types of surveillance systems so systematically and failed to actually bring into the fold as colleagues of mine at the Mid-States Office of the Network, I would be very deferential to their thoughts and comments on this, to Denise Chrysler and others. You know, what and how we, however, have seen a failure to actually engage in 21st century public health surveillance, including federal efforts to literally shut down certain specific surveillance efforts that could have been very helpful and useful, and in midstream change the surveillance practices in the throes of an actual pandemic. We've got to get stability on that specific front. States have got to deliver the right type of data. Localities have to deliver the data. And then at the course, the frontline level in hospitals and other specific settings, it needs to be much clearer as to the types of data needed, when the reporting mechanisms are doing it, privacy norms that actually make great sense, 
and toleration for mismanagement or data errors of that nature should be quite minimal. Then, of course, correct it immediately, as at least we did in Arizona based on that as well. Charles, it's a great observation. So much more goes into the data management side of this particular pandemic. Thank you, James. And I'm not seeing any other questions from our attendees, so. Oh, Rachel, did you have a point, though, about that? Go ahead. No, just very quickly, I heard a, a very valuable point by a colleague, uh, Janet Krebs, who is at the uh, RAD, Reg Regulatory Assistance for Abortion Providers, that um, routinely clinicians uh, say that they cannot trust the advice by the states in which they work. And so because the data that's collected is, is collected with particular political agendas, and it's often, it's often wrong, and they can't trust the regulatory advice they, they receive either. And so there's there's you know, this recurring and longstanding challenge of uh, the battle of evidence, the battle of facts, and um, I just, I'd just add those two cents. Good points. Great, thank you, Rachel. Actually, one more question just came in through the chat just now. Okay, we'll be quick about it, Charles, go for it. Yeah, we'll be quick. So someone says, James mentioned looking to find a guarantee of public health in the Constitution. Can you speak more about that argument? Oh, yeah. Now, that's just, just going to take about an hour or so. So let's just get right to it now, and we'll see where we go. No, I tell you what I will tell you. You email me, and you ask for a little bit more information on that. We've got a great article in University of Michigan's Journal of Law Reform. That'll lay it out for you. But let's say you're not a constitutional scholar. You don't want to get it deep and heavy into it. It boils down to this. Listen. This is unacceptable, what you're seeing nationally. This gross failure to engage in public health service and delivery in response to a known pandemic should not be occurring. There are federal responsibilities at stake. My colleague Larry Gosson at Georgetown has actually talked about how Trump has a duty to respond to these specific issues. Listen, I'm on board with that, but the reality is it's not reflected in constitutional parlance. It does exist because of the inherent vices of government's failure to do so. It's a state responsibility. Several state constitutions can easily be interpreted to provide public health services at this level. We've got an opportunity to pull that off. It's just a masterful argument that's going to require probably a post-COVID analysis with the right take and potentially some new members on the U.S. Supreme Court post-election. We'll see. Great. Well, I just want to thank both of our fantastic panelists today for their presentations and for the Q&A. Uh, just a quick note to all of our attendees, you can take the evaluation for this presentation by scrolling down to the bottom of your Pathful page and pressing the Take Survey link. Otherwise, that concludes today's session, and thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your day. Great. Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate it. Have a great one.